Uh, I promised you a cracking session on the subject of historical fiction. I'm not the reason why this is going to be a cracking session. I have two absolutely marvelous practitioners of the genre with me here. Thank you very much for being enticed away from the suffragettes, because I think they've stolen some of our audience, <laughs> people who would otherwise have been interested in history. I'm taking uh, the assumption that uh, most of you here are interested in history or historical fiction in one way, shape, or form, which is so reassuring. Because it, it really astounds me when I, I meet people who seem to think they don't need to know history and can still make sense of our present times. How else do we put things into context and understand the world we're living in if we don't understand our histories? So um, historical fiction plays a very big part in that, I believe. But more on all of that and on. First, an introduction to my two novelists. Maha Khan Phillips is a multiple award-winning financial journalist and editor and the author of The Curse of Mohenjo-daro, Beautiful from this Angle, and The Mystery of the Agni Ruby. She grew up in Karachi in Pakistan, but now lives in London. She has a bachelor's degree in politics and international relations and master's degrees in international conflict analysis and creative writing. Her most recent work, do you want to hold it up? The Curse of Mohenjo-daro <laughs> is historical fiction or what Maha describes as an archaeological thriller. I'd not heard that term before, actually. I was intrigued by that. But it's set both in 2016 and, wait for this, 3800 BC. If you think a historical fiction writer's taken on a challenge, there's one for you. The people in this audience generally, or particularly those from India and Pakistan, would be well familiar with the name uh, Mohenjo-daro which is the recently, for those who might not know, the recently excavated, relatively recently excavated site uh, in present-day Pakistan that establishes the presence of a highly sophisticated civilization that existed maybe even you know, 5,000 or perhaps more years longer ago than that. Um, what Maha has done is set that history against a present-day narrative about a, a modern-day cult. Um, Following the lives, it's a sort of very deftly uh, done binary narrative, you know, the historical section set against this present day cult and the story of what happens to the people involved in that. Um, and it follows the lives in particular of three fabulous women. So I found that exceedingly readable, I've got to say. The author on my far right is Navtej Sarna, who has written two novels, The Exile and We Weren't Lovers Like That also a short story collection called Winter Evenings. His non-fiction works are The Book of Nanak, Second Thoughts, and Indians at Herod's Gate, a historical travel narrative on the Indian connection to Jerusalem. I'm halfway through it right now, and it is, again, very gripping, very interesting, uh, presumably taken off from Navtej's time living in Israel. Um, he's also done two translations, Zafar Nama, a literary text in Persian by Guru Gobind Singh, and Savage Harvest, 30 Selected Short Stories on Partition by Mohinder Singh Sarna in Punjabi. I don't know how he does it, but Navtej has been a professional diplomat since 1980, serving as High Commissioner of India to the UK and Ambassador to Israel and several other diplomatic assignments. He's presently India's Ambassador to the United States. <laughs> I think we could devote an entire session as to how on earth Navtej manages to be so prodigious in his writing output while also handling a sensitive diplomatic career, but it is my task at hand today is to focus very strictly, unfortunately, on just the genre of historical fiction, <laughs> and in particular on this book, The Exile, which is a story of Maharaja Dilip Singh, um, who became the last Maharaja of the Sikh Empire at the age of five, but was soon after separated from his mother and sent to England at the age of 15. Um, in, shall we say, exile uh, rather than by choice. But anyway, that's something which, again, we will want to, to ask Navtej about. Again, there'll be those in the audience who have already made the connections. But for people unaware of the specific history of the Leap Singh, it was the British government in India um, that had sent, I, I use the word sent rather than exiled the Leap Singh to England in 1854. And shall we say, persuaded him to hand over the Kohinoor to Queen Victoria. Um, there's, there's lots that, that uh, Navtej explains in the book as to how that act came to be. And that was, for me, the most fascinating part of the novel. But I won't at this time say very much more because we're going to kick off with uh, short readings by both novelists. First, we'll begin with Navtej and the voice of Maharaja Dilip Singh. And after that, 
go further back in history. Thank you, Jayashree. Thank you. And wonderful being here. This is the warmest igloo I've ever seen. But, uh, <laughs> In any case, uh, I read this uh, section, as Jeshri said, from in the voice of Maharaja Dilip Singh. Uh, he's recalling the time when he reached England and he became a favorite of Queen Victoria. He was a young prince. He, had, he was conveniently converted to Christianity, which made him even more likable. Uh, he could speak English. Uh, he was rich. So he, was, he became a real favorite of hers. And she actually genuinely liked him. So this is the time when he, uh, he, he is close to her. He's being painted. Many of you may have seen the famous portrait of Maharaja Dalip Singh. I believe it's in the palace on Isle of Wight, in which he's standing straight with a sword. It was painted by the great portrait painter of uh, 19th century Europe, Winter Halter. And uh, so he was posing for him when this scene occurs. Mrs. Fagan, that is what I once called Queen Victoria, the biggest pickpocket of them all, the receiver of stolen goods, stolen kingdoms, stolen jewels, smuggled away to her by her loyal viceroys, men like De Lousy, with immaculate records and long panegyrics, the thousands of pearls and emeralds and rubies and diamonds taken from my Toshakhana and presented to her by the East India Company after the great exhibition of 1851. To be locked away in the Tower of London, stuck in her tiara, sewn on her dresses. That's how she received the Kohinoor. De Lousy tucked it away into a chamois bag specially made by his wife, which was then sewn into his belt by Logan. Today it matters little to me whether I have it or not. If I had it, who knows what I might do with it. Perhaps I would trade it for a few sunny days, a few happy conversations, some justice, a fair inquiry into my case, and certainly for a journey to Punjab. Or just throw it into the river for all that it has done for me. But as a child, I used to yearn for it, especially when the courtiers would set up Darbar in Fatehgarh and talk of the lost glory of Lahore. I did see the near mythical stone once in my years of exile. I even held it in my hand for a few moments. It happened on an evening in Buckingham Palace, soon after my arrival in England. The Queen was very fond of me those days, and I must admit, so was I, of her and her family. She was having my portrait painted by that artist Winterhalter. The man did a good job. He made me look tall and handsome, like a real prince. He was used to painting European royalty, and I suppose he knew how to massage egos, even the ego of a Maharaja without a throne. He said I would grow into the picture. I never was to grow that tall, but I hope people remember me like he made me look, and not how I actually have become, bald and fat. He would make me pose two hours at a time in the white drawing room of the palace. The Queen would come in just to watch me, every inch her loyal subject, with a portrait set in diamonds around my neck and a miniature picture in a ring on my finger. Yes, she had reason to be fond of me those days. I was such a great addition to her banquets, a fine specimen to show off to the rest of society. A young Oriental king who spoke English and to top it all was Christian. I also said things that must have eased her conscious. conscience. I would tell her that I was glad to be in England, far away from the violent ways of my people. I even told her on a ferry ride to the Isle of Wight that I had become a Christian because of my own beliefs and that I had broken caste by having tea with Tommy Scott and by drinking from the same glass as Lady Logan in front of Rani Dukno. I exculpated everybody, De Lousy, Logan, Lady Logan, even Bhajanlal, from having anything to do with my change of faith and took it all upon myself. Is one still a child at 16 to be forgiven such complete surrender to manipulation? But I was talking of the Kohinoor and the days of the Winterhalter portrait. One of those mornings, Lady Logan and I were riding in Richmond Park when she turned towards me suddenly. Maharaja, have you ever thought of seeing the Kohinoor again? A prickly excitement ran through me. For a moment, I thought that everything was turning out all right the coming to England, becoming a good Christian, and everything else had been worth it, that I was being rewarded for my good behavior. Yes, Lady Logan, I would very much like to see the Kohinoor again, was all I said. 
I was still not prepared for what happened a few evenings after that conversation. I was standing very still for winter halter. All of a sudden, the curtains parted and four tall beef eaters in full dress down to their sabers entered the room. An official stood timidly between them, holding a large box. From the corner of my eye, I saw Her Majesty walk quickly to the official and open the box. She held it, and for a moment, both she and the Prince Consort stated qu stared quietly at whatever it was inside the box. Then she called me, Maharaja, I have something to show you. I stepped off the dais and walked quickly to her. She held out the open box towards me. The Kohinoor, Maharaja, I understand that you had wanted to see it. I looked again at the magical diamond that had been mine, that had meant so much to me, my father, my beautiful fairy mother, my people. It seemed much smaller than I remembered it. I have had it cut, Maharaja, by the best cutters available. It shines better now. She picked it out of the box and put it into my palm. I took it between my thumb and forefinger and held it up to the light. I could not look away from the quiet dazzle. I stood staring at it near the open window and a rush of emotions began to drown me. I realized I had lost everything. I was no longer a king. I was only being made to dress up like one and amuse the Queen's court. I was angry, angry enough to fling the diamond in the lawns below. I was sad. I was demeaned. What did Her Majesty want me to do? To kneel down and thank her for showing me what in fact belonged to me? When the rush in my blood subsided, I knew what I wanted to do. I would make it clear that the Kohinoor was mine by right. So far it had been stolen from me. Now I would gift it to her. I walked back from the window to Her Majesty. Handing the box with the diamond back to her, I said, It is to me, ma'am, the greatest pleasure thus, to have the opportunity of myself tendering to my sovereign, the Kohinoor. I do not think she understood how I had felt. I do not think she cared enough. For her, it was only a passing whim, a show of preposterous royal magnanimity, or a fitting show of loyalty. But how does it matter now, all this business of so long ago? Before we move on to other things, maybe I should turn the Leap Singh's question back to you for a minute, both of you actually. Why should it matter all this long ago? Why do we write historical fiction? Why, should, why do we expect people to read? Well, as, as you said, you know, I mean, people who uh, are interested in history need to know history. I think to understand the present, you need to know the past. Uh, if, you aren't, if there are people who are interested in their own uh, roots, if they are interested in their own, uh, uh, the dilemmas that they face today, they must understand the dilemmas that they have faced in the past. So I think it really matters how, and it's not all that long ago, it's 170 years ago. You need to know uh, what happened to you, what happened to Punjab, what happened to different parts of India, different parts of uh, points of time. Uh, uh, I mean, and the Kohinoor is still here. So when you go and see it in the Tower of London, uh, there are all sorts of emotions that pass through you, depending who you are and how much you know about what happened. Uh, so I think it is still very relevant. Uh, I saw it only once, but before I wrote the book. I, I might see it differently today. <laughs> yeah, I had no idea it had been cut. I mean, that's uh, very it was, tragic. It was cut uh, in Belgium. Yeah. Um, it was a huge, uh, large uh, uh, diamond. And, but I think the, the, the fashion in, in, in Europe was more to, uh, you know, sparkle, make it sparkle. Yeah. Uh, so I think the size was uh, sacrificed for the shine. It was Prince Albert, I think, whose idea it was. It must have yeah. been. <laughs> he had lots of good ideas. <laughs> <laughs> and this history in particular, where it comes, we were talking about this yesterday, wasn't it? Is that the way in which this history is being taught in Britain or not taught? You have a son who goes to... Yes, uh, <laughs> who's going to love the fact that I mentioned this because he's in the audience and I'm, I'm sure thrilled to be embarrassed by me. But um, it's very interesting to me because he was studying the British Empire in school and uh, uh, they're studying the Britain in the British Empire. And I asked his teacher, are you going to study partition and, you know, all of that? And the answer was a deer in headlights moment. And then she said, no, but we're talking about slavery. 
Yeah. And uh, sorry, Ro, for bringing you up. But anyway, um, and I think that's the kind of challenge we have to get people to remember these histories and think about these histories. And they're so important to what we go through today. Um, and even in 3,800 BC or 2,500 BC, uh, I could argue till the cows come home <laughs> that, that it's very relevant. Uh, and we, on that, yeah. have a little reading from your book as well. Sure. We take this. Sure, it's very hot. And I just have to say, the lady with the ice cream there, I've been watching you <laughs> <laughs> enviously. Can you tell me after where you got it? Because I'm very jealous. <laughs> Thank you. All of us focusing on your ice cream now. <laughs> So it's actually, uh, ice cream, it comes from Mohenjo-daro. It is. <laughs> we invented ice cream, don't you know? I bet they had ice cream making <laughs> machines <laughs> back then. Um, I'm not sure about the ice cream, but uh, we do have chess in uh, the Indus Valley civilization. And we have the invention of dice. And obviously, you can tell that I'm very excited about this period of history. Um, so in a book where lots and lots of things happen, I have, just to warn you, chosen the section where nothing happens, um, only because it sets the scene for um, uh, the Indus Valley world that I've created. So half this, uh, this world is about a modern day cult. Uh, half this book is about a modern day cult in 2016. And half of it is set in 3800 BC. And my character is Jaya. And she's a reluctant priestess. So um, she's in a world uh, with her daughter, called, uh, whose name is Al, um, in a city called Maluha, which is what the Sumerians, we think, uh, called uh, the Indus Valley city of Mohenjo-daro. And the city is on the brink of a revolution. A crowd was gathering in the square. Children danced along the edges. Some were playing corky. Others pushed toy carts and bullocks along the brick road. Women from the alehouses were selling barley beer from wooden trays which hung from their necks, and slices of oranges were on display at a fruit stall in the corner, though few could afford the steep prices. All around, the steady hum of excited voices. The street was awake and alive with possibility. In the middle of it all was the raised platform where the dancing girls came at night to sell their bodies. Today, a caravan had arrived, so there would be stories to barter instead. The platform was currently occupied by Noor, an unclanned man from the north, who was well known and widely loved in the city. He was gaunt and long-limbed, wearing a brown robe and a rope belt across his waist, on which he had put his many treasures, an eagle feather, a string of agate, a jade dagger given to him by the lord of the north. Noor was an adventurer. He had accompanied many a trading caravan over the cycles, journeying the length and breadth of the Northlands, and even to the west, where the light-skinned tribes would sooner kill a man than ask his name. The man lived by his wits and was popular with the caravan leaders because of the many tongues he could speak. He had survived being unclanned, a rarity in Maluha, though many clans would have him if he wanted. Noor liked to go his own way. There was no price too high for freedom, he was often heard saying. Surprisingly, nobody had tried to kill him for it. Gather around, he shouted, his eyes gleaming, for today I have a story that will amaze you beyond your comprehension. It is a story of anger, of jealousy, of true passion, when a blue-eyed witch tried to curse the young prince of Chol. Al raced forward excitedly, diving into the throng. Jaya watched her and smiled. Her daughter should enjoy herself while she could. She would be safe enough. She took the opportunity to slip away for a moment or two. She preferred to wander to the stalls further down the street, to enjoy the time away from the temple in relative obscurity while the crowds were distracted by the tail. She felt the sun tickle her skin and tilted her head up so her cheeks burnt with the heat. Unlike the rest of the goddess blessed, she refused to wear a veil in public. In some respects, being without a veil gave her anonymity, at least until the passers-by noticed her tattoo. Much to the surprise of others, Yaf did not censor her for it. There was plenty of time to wallow in the cool darkness of the temple. She longed for the sun's kiss. She paused to admire a chessboard for sale, trailing her fingers lightly against the ivory and clay pieces. Perhaps it was time to teach Al, as Hermwa had taught her all those cycles ago. She had been so diligent about filling their coffers, a little something to keep the two of them amused in these dark times would surely be no bad thing. How much? she asked. The merchant saw her tattoo and stuttered. 
For you, lady, I beg only that you keep me in your prayers. Please take it with my good wishes. But I must pay something, Jaya protested. It is a fine piece of craftsmanship. You must have worked so hard to polish the pieces to shape them so. The man looked down, embarrassed. Jaya sighed. As usual, she would have to take matters into her own hands. She lifted the merchant's scales, which rested on the corner of the table. She pulled out three copper pieces from her deerskin pouch and placed them on one of the scales. Then she picked up two of the cubic measures from the table and placed them on the other scale. It did not balance, her copper raised slightly. So she added another small piece of copper until the scales were even. She looked at the combined weights and nodded, satisfied. Two cubes worth, enough for a deer shank or a wild boar, including the tusks. You can use the tusks to make your next board if you like. Lady, I will not have your family go hungry simply because I wanted to play a game of chess. Take it and take my blessings with it. The man looked up, smiling with relief. He shoveled the copper pieces into the folds of his tunic quickly, as though he were worried that she would change her mind. He wrapped the chessboard and pieces into a square of old cloth and tied a knot on the top. He handed it to her, and she nodded her thanks and moved away. Thank you. I was constantly struck by how you could possibly have researched an era that hasn't left behind for us, you know, the gifts of photographs and first-person accounts and any kind of real meaningful primary source material, which is what most historical fiction writers rely on so much. I mean, why Mohan Chudaro? What piqued your interest? Why go so far back? So I have uh, been obsessed with Mohan Chudaro uh, since I was about 11. I don't know, is there anyone here who's been? Okay. Oh my goodness. Wow, me. lots of you have been. I That's great. A rough ride. <laughs> a rough ride? No, lots okay. of questions. <laughs> Mound, mound of the Dead. Mound yeah. of the Dead, I think it's because. Oh, maybe oh, they were trying to Islamicize it. Okay, well, I went when I was 11, so that was a long time ago, and a school field trip. And I just got gripped with this place. I was dazzled by it. And, you know, the, in Pakistan, you don't actually often go to these places of amazement that we have in the country. We don't get opportunities to go. Um, and so it always stayed with me, and it stayed with me that we didn't know what happened to the civilization, that we didn't know how it ended. Um, and, and this is how far back I've been thinking about this idea. In the days of dial-up internet, I'm sure we can all, some of us can remember dial-up internet. Um, and when you would Google just because, for the sake of Googling, because it was still a novelty, I decided to Google and I wrote Mahanjadaro Mystery. And much to my shock and amazement, um, there are so many conspiracies about what happened to this, uh, this, uh, this Indus Valley civilizations from ancient, ancient aliens to uh, telepathic mind control to flying, uh, flying airplanes and all kinds of things. And I thought, oh, that would make a great thriller. Too bad I'm not a novelist. <laughs> um, and then I went off many years later and started writing. And I came back to this idea of this would be a great place to write about. Uh, and I started writing my thriller. And... Uh, in fact, we wrote a whole thriller set in 2016 um, about the forbidden science movement and cults uh, and what, what they believe happened in this fascinating place. Um, and it wasn't working. I mean, I, sp I spent a year struggling with it, and it was, um, it was a kind of very, very straightforward thriller. It just didn't resonate with me. Um, and then I had a character who dreamt about the past, and so I added a couple of scenes from the past, and those were so much fun to write, and I got so excited writing them, but then I got uh, stuck again, because I thought, I'm a journalist by profession, I thought there is not enough information about this place, how could I write about the past? It just doesn't exist. Um, and then a very brilliant woman, the writer Kamla Shamsi, uh, said to me... It helps to have novelist friends. It helps to have novelist friends. She said, why are you getting... Uh, stagnated by this. This should be the best thing that ever <laughs> happened to you. You know, you can do whatever you want and nobody's there to, you know, to question it. And for me, that was a very liberating moment. I thought, oh, I can do whatever I want. You know, I'm just going to have fun with this. And I sort of leapt from there into this world and made it what I wanted to make it. That's the thing. Is, is that true, though, that we can really do exactly what we want when we have 
when we actually, well, how much, how much um, liberty do you think it's all right to take with the information that's out there? In some ways, I think this question comes to Navtej. Well, it? mine was a, a, a much sharper choice, uh, so to speak, because I was writing about something which is uh, 200 years old, and there are sources. Uh, uh, the advantage that I had was uh, that there are uh, uh, very, uh, very sort of one-sided sources. Most of the yeah. mention of Maharaja Dalip Singh is in British sources. Uh, <coughs> very little occurred in Indian uh, history books. Uh, uh, even Kushwan Singh's book is sort of a summary dismissal of, uh, you know, he writes a lot about the Sikh Empire, but not much about Maharaja Dalip Singh. Uh, and that also he relies on British sources as primary uh, material. So while there were things which were known, I could not play around with those things. So that's why I decided not to write a non another non-fiction book mm -hmm. in which I would uh, be, you know, just trying to uh, uh, prolong those, uh, the same sort of uh, stories and arguments. So, well, I, I made a decision that whatever was historical and was known, I would not change that. So all the facts that are there in this book are true. What I have added to were the blank spaces. I mean, we didn't know how he felt. We didn't know, uh, you know, what, what sort of moods he had. Uh, but that also I've had to rely, I've, I've not gone too far from reality. I've relied on his letters to con make them into conversations, for instance. Uh, I've relied on other people's recollections or memoirs, etc., about how things were uh, around that time. So, yes, if taken some liberties with these emotional and the psychological aspects of the personality, but no liberties with the actual historical facts because it was too near, uh, you know, I suppose too near to the present. And you didn't want the whole book ruined by somebody writing a letter, you know, but you said in 1854, it actually happened in 1839, you know, so, uh, you know, so you had to, and I had to very prominently request my publishers that, Please classify this as fiction, and it's it's fiction ultimately because uh, it does act drama, it does act uh, feelings and, and things like that. But so I think it's there a, is a little problem in that people want the easy way to get their histories, and very often historical fiction is the genre that's chosen, and then which is why, which is why you can't play around with historical detail, because many people who would not know anything about you know, the annexation of Punjab or the Koinur, perhaps may just read this one book mm -hmm. and may spend their whole life thinking that this is what happened. So I did not want to take the responsibility of distorting somebody's vision for life on this. So, you know, so I think that is a, it's a fine line, which you, because you're absolutely right, this is popular history. And the problem of how much you can trust your archives. I mean, I was wondering whether it's okay to say things like this when we're seated in the hallowed environs of the British Library, which is where most historical fiction writers, especially researching certain periods in history, would come straight to. How much can you trust that archive to give you all facets of the history and how much? Do you need to know the languages in which the the original histories of Can I come in on this? Yeah, and no, I, 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 I did spend some time in the British Library when I was researching this, and a lot more time in the National Archives in Delhi. So you certainly can't find all aspects of a situation in one place. So I think that's where your own uh, sort of, maybe your biases or your perspective comes in. That's why you say this is written by, from an Indian point of view or a British point of view. I mean. You, you, can see, you can see what is distorted, you can see what is, with the, you know, with the perspective of 150 years, you can see that but this was wrong, this never happened, or this, this is obviously, uh, a, you know, a colonial bias, or I can look at the other side and say, no, no, this is, they didn't really understand what was happening, you know. So, uh, so you can't get it all in one place. So you have to pick bits and pieces. But if you keep your talisman as the thing that, look, I'm not changing history. I'm not rewriting history. I'm just putting life in history. Filling you know? in those gaps. Yeah, yeah I'm just putting life in history. So that way you don't uh, distort the facts. 
you can pick something from here, you can pick something from there. I've, I was mentioning, I, I visited Lahore uh, when I was researching this book. Mm -hmm. and, and I used to just, you know, I had four or five opportunities to just walk around Lahore Fort because that's where he grew. He was so just to see, you know, if he was standing here, what would he be seeing? What, what sort of, you know, how's the breeze here? What are the smells here? Mm -hmm. You know, that sort of a thing. So which, which the historical novelist can do. Mm. But a historian doesn't bother about all that. Quite right. I He's know. more busy saying, you know, but I want that letter, I want that, you know, particular dialogue, uh, what happened, etc. So... Nevertheless, historians are very scornful of the genre of historical fiction. <laughs> what would you have to say to them? <laughs> I mean, I, I apparently I'm in for a rough time. Uh, no, so I, I, why, uh, but fiction, um, guys. In, in, in my <laughs> case, it was, uh, it was different. I don't, ha I don't feel I have that responsibility that you clearly do because, um, I mean, it, it's a thriller, it's a fiction. Um, I have a world populated by forbidden scientists um, and I don't know if you've read the books of Graham Hancock or any of the sort of forbidden science movement, but uh, would that be factual? I mean, they would certainly argue that it is. I don't think the rest of us would. Um, so I didn't have those challenges. I think my challenges, I mean, I have a, 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 a ancient artifact that kills people. So I mean, it's not <laughs> based in any kind of reality in that way. But where the history came from was my passion for this, this civilization and wanting to bring it to life in my own way, but just wanting to say, look, there's this world. And for so many people, uh, had never even heard of it. Um, when you say you, you, you perhaps don't have as much, you didn't feel the weight of responsibility on you as much as Navtej did, because it's so much more ancient. There is, and you're aware that there's this growing interest in mm. India particularly, I don't know whether it's the same in Pakistan, for all these, these mm. theories around this great civilization which was once Indian, <laughs> yeah. is bound to be, and, 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 and all the very wonderful things that they had and did, yeah. which, you know, it's plastic surgery and... Yeah, material. yeah, I mean, that is very problematic for me, I have to say. I didn't think of that when I was writing this book, and I didn't realize that I was going to get that kind of uh, feedback, but it's problematic for me on, on both sides. First of all, who owns the Indus Valley civilization? Uh, India, Pakistan, uh, but what about Oman, where there's, doing s there's so much archaeological work at the moment and they're establishing the trading links and everything else? Um, you know, it's, it's early days. We've barely excavated a, a percentage of the 2,000 sites that we've found so far. And Just there are last many, week many. There was something in the papers. Uh, last week there was something about, oh, look, there's, these are the chariots of the gods. We found them mm -hmm. at a dig uh, in India. In but Pradesh, there's yeah. no uh, sense that that could be a bullet. Cart, you know, a wheel from a bullet cart. So I, I find that very difficult, and uh, it's happening. You know, in Pakistan, we are uh, rewriting history, and the, the people are disclaiming it. So in India, is kind of there's, there's that sense of this is ours, and in Pakistan, there's a sense of no, there's no. In some quarters, there's nothing before Islamic history, and I've got that feedback myself from people saying, but we don't want to, we don't want to teach this in books anymore, in schools anymore. We are an Islamic country. It's so sad on both sides. This shouldn't be how we think about history and how we uh, rewrite history. This is who we are. This is our identity. And we are not myopic. We're not one place. We come from everywhere. And particularly, I, I point this out. You know, if you look at Scotland, any Scottish people here today? OK, so probably your ancestors came from the Indus Valley. They did lots of DNA <laughs> testing. So I, I don't think anyone has the right to claim this is theirs. It's all of ours. We're, it belongs to all of us, and it's our history. And how much should the present-day novelist, the pre your, your modern-day sensibility, sort of slip into your, in, into your writing when you're writing about such ancient times? Well, uh, I, I, I think you, 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 if you're writing of a particular character and a particular time, then you have to be true to that time. Uh, and, and, you know, you can't... Uh, you can't judge them by present-day sensibilities. Uh, so I think one has to be mindful of that uh, as to what, you know, you, you have to be mindful of fashion, practice, clothes, uh, you know, and, and you can't suddenly, I mean, you know, I, you can't introduce uh, uh, concepts of a hundred years later. So that's, that's again part of it. I absolutely agree. That's the nuts and bolts of the, of the writing itself. But yeah. if, if I'm, what I'm talking about is the irresistibility 
of drawing parallels to what we see around us now. Actually, where it came to the Leap Singh story, the bit, I, there was a line that I made a note of because I was so struck by the resonances with the present day, which was when he says, I had not just lost a kingdom, but also a religion, a people, a way of life, everything that could be home. And that spoke to me immediately about what is really the big story of our times of migration and people having to leave everything and flee to somewhere far away. Yeah, I, I, was, I was thinking more in terms of the concept of exile. So, you know, a migration is, is, is in many cases a, a voluntary act, in many cases, and sometimes it is forced migration. I mean, if you're talking of the refugees coming into Europe, uh, yes, I can understand that they would, you know, so I would distinguish which, which is a kind of an exile. So I think it is the act of exile itself, which is, which is really the, you know, dehumanizing thing because it takes away so much uh, about it and you know there is a quotation at the beginning of the book just read a couple of lines the exile is strangely compelling to think about but terrible to experience it is the unhealable rift forced between a human being and a native place between the self and its true home its essential sadness can never be surmounted and while it is true that literature and history contain heroic, romantic, glorious, even triumphant episodes in an exile's life, these are no more than efforts meant to overcome the crippling sorrow of estrangement. The achievements of exile are permanently undermined by the loss of something left behind forever. So this is Edward Said. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, civilizations have seen exile. I mean, I, I know from my stay in, in Israel, I mean, while you have this, you have the whole Jewish idea of exile and the Jewish history of, of exile, you, you have the exile of, uh, uh, of the colonized people. You know, we, in India, we used to call Kalapani. Mm -hmm. Those people uh, were picked up, uh, I mean, the, during the colonial role and sent off for life exile to the Andaman Islands, you know, to the cellular jail or whatever. So you were, you were sent across the black waters, which means it's all, all over. Yeah. So that sense of loss, that sense of estrangement uh, is, uh, is, is I, I think it's timeless. So whether you talk of today, or it's, it depends upon... It's irresistible, certainly as a reader, to not sort of seek those modern day messages and stuff. Whether it's intended by the writer is something which, which, which is what I was trying to explore. But one of the beautiful things about writing historical fiction is that so much doesn't change, isn't it? There's so much that you can rely on to have stayed the same. And I think for you in particular, this would have probably been helpful. It was really helpful, actually. I mean, first of all, there's that phrase, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. Um, and I was mindful of that. But actually, I was uh, talking to Michael Janssen, who's the archaeologist who's been really at the forefront of excavating Mohanjadaro. And, and I was asking him all these questions, and I, it was clear that he was getting frustrated with me. You know, I was like, well, what would they have done in this situation? What they have had? And he was saying, but we don't know, we don't know, we don't know. But then he said, look, you know, not much has changed. Why don't you just go and look at how people live and go look at the boat people and how they're on their boats and how they tie their babies to the boats. And, mm -hmm. and actually, not much has changed in some ways, A, literally, in, in this uh, part of the world. So that was really helpful mm -hmm. just to say, oh, look, look what people are doing now in these boats and how they're living and if you uh, somebody showed me a picture of the Mahanjadaro ruins and somebody's house uh, in the same location and it was virtually the same to look at anyway um, so that, that was really helpful to just think oh there's people living in the same ways and we have the same human emotions and the same human motivations yes. that's, that's it and that uh, we, are, we are driven by the same things uh, and that's something I think that all writers try and communicate in different ways um, in every genre, in every, in every situation. Um, but also for me personally, I, you know, I, I, um, I had a world in decline, and that was interesting to me. And I had a world in revolution, and that was interesting to me. Um, and the power was, of religion was interesting to me, which is why I had a lot of priests in there. Um, and what happens when we uh, neglect each other and we become uh, us and them? And so I did draw on that, I mean, in the context of a fun thriller. And I wanted to draw on that because those are the kind of things that I think about. I think it was Robert Harris when he was researching for Pompeii, the, the book set in ancient Rome, that it, for him it was that. It was that the sense he was standing on a hillside and he said, it's the same sunshine falling on me that fell on those people, mm. the same rubble under my feet that they would have experienced. So that's, it's that, that um, 
comfort that I think is, is available to the historical fiction. Yeah, and as, as Ma said, I think the ultimate thing is human reactions, human impulses, the way human beings relate to each other, those don't change. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, that's the essence of fiction. And the rest is decoration. <laughs> it seems to me almost, actually, that it, 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 you, need, you need to tell history via the genre of historical fiction. History, factual history, I don't care what historians, there might be historians sitting here who are going to give me a hard time afterwards. <laughs> but, it, it, to, to, you know, for a student, a very reluctant student of history when I was at school, I was given a set, bare set of facts and dates and I'd struggled. But if I had had the chance, or if a teacher had encouraged me to go off and read historical fiction like yours, I would have been so much, so much better at my uh, knowledge of everything that's happened. I'm being signaled that there's a sort of reaching a kind of winding down time. So rather than plowing on through my questions, I will open it up to the audience as well, so you can start thinking about your questions. But I feel like asking just one more in the meantime. Um, I did a little lot of my research from Hilary Mantle's wreath lectures. I don't know whether she did this brilliant thing, but ever since she started writing historical fiction and winning Booker Prizes and so on, historians have kind of shut up, isn't it? Mm. <laughs> she said this thing about, um, was it the problem of predictability? Especially when you write a story which is where everyone knows what happened. Now, everyone knows the Mohenjo-daro civilization came to an end. Everyone knows Maharaja Dalip Singh was exiled and could never come back home. When you know the end of the story. What, yeah, how do you keep the narrative tension going? Well, I think it's because, you know, what happens, everything, uh, we know the end of all stories. But, you know, it, if when you're talking of historical fiction, but again, it is, the, it is what happened during that story that you can add something to. I'll just give you my personal example. I mean, everybody knew, knew that the Lip Singh went off to England. Uh, he was painted as a, you know, a generally derelict character. He was uh, uh, changed his religion. Uh, he was called a womanizer. He was a drunkard. He ran out of money. This is a popular conception at one level, even amongst historians. Uh, so I actually went with my very tentative idea to the great Sikh historian, uh, Kushwan Singh. And when I, he had given a nice blurb to my first a review of my first book, so I gathered up some courage and went to him. And when I went and sat in front of him and I said, this is this thing. And he said, uh, in Punjabi he told me, but uh, translate, basically he said, you know, don't make him a hero. <laughs> you know, you young guys will make this guy a hero. He was all this, all this, all this. So I went off with that thought in my head. And I thought, you know, a hero doesn't always need to be successful. A weak man can also be a hero if his character turns at some place. Yeah. So after I did my research, I actually found this man is a tragic hero. You know, he, when I read his letters, I found that he was no, you know, he may be, he was a Maharaja. So what if he drank and had fun, you know? So he was a Maharaja. If he had been Maharaja of Lahore, of, you know, he would have done all this and everybody would have felt happy. Simply because he was exiled here, they, you know, resented him a drink. So, <laughs> so you know, he, uh, so I found that he was a tragic hero because ultimately he revolted. He rejected what had been thrust on him. He went back and he reconverted to uh, Sikhism. And he took a political decision to try to go back to India. So he re redeemed himself. Try to take back. Yeah, but so when I did all that and I went back to Kushwan Singh, I didn't go back. The publishers went back. I said, I'm not going there. <laughs> he kicked me out. So the publisher said, OK, we'll try. If he's positive, then you go and meet him. I said, all right. So they came back saying, go ahead. Okay. You know, so I, I went to him. And I, so then he, uh, he said, no, I've read the book. You've done justice to him. And then he gave me uh, a blurb for the front cover, you know, which I thought we was the biggest matches. accolade I could, <laughs> I could get. So, you know, it, while you knew the end, but there were many ups and downs to reach that end. Right, right. And, and I think the, it, it's a sort of fiction as an act of repair. To some extent, I think yeah. that is, it's fair enough, isn't it? So questions from the audience? I think there might be... I do have to ask you not to give anyone a hard time. You can be a little... Right. You can dissent a little bit. And also, please, no very long statements, mostly in the interest of time. So make it a question, if you can possibly. There's a person right there. 
And then the Scottish gentleman at the back who mm. might want to know how come he comes from Mohenjo-daro. Thank, <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. It's very interesting. I don't write fiction. I actually write uh, non-fiction. And I always thought these non-fiction writers must have a really easy time because they do, don't do any research at all. But I've learned through the last decade or two that actually that's not true. So the genre you write in is a very powerful and meaningful and um, useful way of communicating, just in case there are some historians here listening. Um, my question is, the, you, you mentioned, both of you, that you do keep your facts historically accurate. When it comes to things like um, dates and places and individuals, that's very easy. And all the other bits where there are gaps, you fill in. But there will be in parts of your work where you've drawn some dramatic uh, imagination and made some statements. And I just wondered if you could comment on that. And specifically, for example, uh, I think you mentioned that there was, um, uh, he described himself, Dulipsin described himself as uh, short and fat. And in your case, Ma, I think you said uh, um, chessboard was discovered mm. in Mahanjadaro. And I was wondering how, to how, how accurately <coughs> the chessboard would be a chessboard in our time. How realistic and accurate is that? You want to go first? Should we? Well, in, in my case, uh, the chessboard, I'll just answer that quickly, um, is not the chessboard that you see today. I mean, it is the grid, and you see the pieces, and they're shaped in different ways, but it's not the metamorphosis of today's chessboard. I don't think that precludes me from calling it a chessboard. We don't know what it would have been called back in that day. I could have called it something else, um, but I wanted to draw the link because it is effectively a very similar structure and game. Pieces, many, many boards, many, many pieces. In fact, uh, you, can, you can Google uh, them. They're in the museum, yeah. Uh, Mine was very easy. There are photographs <laughs> which show him in that elongated, handsome portrait and show him uh, down the years. Uh, when he's about 40, 45, he, he is exactly. And he was never tall. I mean, he, he was a short man, but he sort of put on fair amounts of weight. Next question. My, my question is really to do with the Mohenjo-Daro story, and that is to, to ask whether you feel that you've had a, a role in revealing the history which is puzzling so many people. I mean, is your fiction tying together all sorts of things which are disparate and other people don't really understand the connection? Well, in my case, I, I have a cult, so, uh, and I've talked about forbidden science. Um, and the forbidden science movement, I don't know if you're familiar with it, so it's people who believe that uh, the pyramids were made by some celestial force, and they believe that there is alien technology in Mohanjo-daro, and they've looked at the script, the Indus Valley script of Mohanjo-daro, and they've compared it to the script of Easter Island. And they've said, why are these two scripts the same? How can they be the same? Because they're, we wouldn't have had the capability to travel the length and breadth of the world at that time. And so you know, there's a whole group of people that, that believe all of this. So I didn't feel... Um, uh, I'm, I'm not suggesting that that's accurate, and I certainly made that clear in, in my disclaimers, but this is the story that I was interested in uh, telling. So you're enjoying the fiction, basically. It's you, in, you, in you, entirely you fiction, but I, I, it, yeah. yeah, I mean, for me it's fiction, but even in, when I'm reading historical fiction, I, I want to be immersed in a world. Um, I think it's clear when it's something um, like your book that we want it to be accurate. You know, we, we want a level of accuracy, and, and I would pick it up and hope that, you know, I learned something uh, about a very important character in history. I wasn't doing that in the same way. I was looking at these kind of wild conjectures and saying, this is a world where uh, there's a thriller, you know, somebody goes missing, a group of people go missing, there's a race against time. I'm not trying to say that this is historically accurate. Great. Well, I, I'm going to get a copy straight away, you know. <laughs> Are there any more? Yeah. Do we have time for more? Hi, thank you so much. I really enjoyed listening to both those extracts. Um, so just quickly, um, just a question linked to education in, in schools. Um, as you said with relation to your son, history in schools is incredibly Eurocentric, which makes no sense in such multicultural societies, especially exam uh, London being in a case in point. Do you, do you think historical fiction, such as the books you've, you've written, would be um, an you know, would help supplement 
his, history lessons as such, the history syllabus, and would perhaps um, create that sense of, you know, being able to relate to people who have been othered historically and are never really covered in the traditional syllabuses. Absolutely. I mean, both my fellow okay. panelists have written uh, wonderful historical fiction, and uh, I'm looking forward to passing it on to my son when he's old enough, because I think uh, if he's not going to learn about colonialism and partition in school and the impact of colonialism, then he's going to learn it from these guys. I think it's absolutely yeah. essential. I think my book should be taught in every school. <laughs> Off the world. It would not only do wonders for my sales, but <laughs> I think it would call for a review of, uh, you know, the British Raj in India. <laughs> Sorry. Do we have the time? Maharaja Dilip Singh met his mother he, in 1863. He was given permission to go back. She was then almost blind. She had been in exile in Nepal. And they met in Calcutta. He was not allowed to go to Punjab. Then he got permission to get her here. And she came and stayed with him. He bought a place for her to stay. She died here. He took the body back and cremated her back in India. <laughs> nice to end on a positive note, actually. Yes, <laughs> but I, I, I couldn't resist this. Um, do we have a few more minutes? Because I did see another hand going yeah, up. And I thought done. he's... Oh, two or three hands. Ten minutes. Yeah. Do we? Okay, we've got ten minutes, I believe. Yes. Ambassador Sahib tells me. <laughs> I'm going to go with him. <laughs> uh, the, the lady there with her hand up. Um, on teaching in English schools, my son is now 14 and he's in school here. Um, a couple of years ago, they did a whole semester, a whole term on the British Raj. And uh, he's, he's in school in Nottingham. It's a very ethnically mixed school. Um, and they, they spent a whole term and they, they really focused on, on the British Raj. So I think things are being taught. They also go every two years to the battlefields, the First World War battlefields, because lots of children, boys from the school fell there. And there's very ethnically mixed, lots of Sikhs, Muslims, Sikhs, Muslims, Hindus, and they look for the Indian graves as well. So I think things are changing. Um, definitely, I've been pleased that he's been exposed to, Good, to this. Really so I don't think it's all and negative. That's so great. So hopefully in, in a few years' yeah. time, the same will happen to us. Well, I, I hope so. Yeah. I hope so. I particularly enjoyed them going going to look for not just the, the Which grave. battlefield did they go to? They went all around Ypres, the Somme, and okay. they looked, uh, but they made a point of looking for the Indian lists and the Indian graves because they had a lot of boys from the subcontinent, so they made a point of yeah. doing that as well. But the history teacher was consciously feeding that into the curriculum of her own, of her own bat, to be fair. Because that, that, that's very encouraging to hear. Mm. But, and, and this is a fact, because again, we, we are in the centenary of the First World War, and uh, the number of uh, soldiers who actually came and fought in Europe from India is something which you know very few people know about, and but I'm glad it's. But the know, names is, are all there. The names are all there, there, and yeah. and I'd, I'd I'm happy. To, I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm I can share with you that many people in even India are now realizing, mm -hmm. uh, were not fully aware of exactly yeah. how many people we lost and yeah. in which battlefield. But if you go to the, I mean, many people yeah. here might not be so aware. This has now been go, a project yeah. which has which has reclaimed that that yeah. bit of historical yeah. detail. There was one hand that is quite persistent. <laughs> Hello. Um, you mentioned you mentioned that um, in your piece um, that uh, human emotions, human reactions, are essentially all the same. Um, obviously, you're bringing psychology and other emotions into the the account that you've given of this prince. I just wondered whether those same emotions, uh, how do they translate in a formal environment, in a formal diplomatic environment? With in, in, in the current situation and how you handle that? <laughs> Slightly curveball. Well, you know, I, I, I think uh, diplomacy is, 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 um, is an art as much as a science, perhaps more an art. And uh, I, I think while, while there are the scientific aspects of diplomacy, which all of us do, but I think what distinguishes a good diplomat from a sort of average diplomat would be his understanding of human emotions and human reactions. So if you can read a story in the flicker of an eyebrow, then uh, you're a better diplomat than the guy who missed it. 
So I think uh, in probably in diplomacy more than perhaps in many other professions, uh, a fine understanding of human reactions, a fine, fine uh, understanding of nuance is something which is bread and butter for us. That, that actually does bring me to one of the questions that I had to miss because of uh, I was getting these boards saying five minutes, five minutes. I've got another five minute board. Five minutes is a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a, the matter of offense in India. You know, what do you do with that? Again, I'm asking matter you of this offense. When people say they're offended by so and so film, Jodha Akbar, because they use the wrong name, they use Akbar's mother's name rather than his wife's name, or when these are all, it's all historical fiction, and yet people think. It's meant to be proper history. You're playing with history, they say. Well, you know, I, I'm fortunately on the side of creation. Mm. And I leave the reception to others. <laughs> Good diplomatic answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, but you don't get a second question. <laughs> however, however pressing it was. Hi, thank you very much. That was really interesting. Um, I really question the fact that uh, historical novels are supposed to provide history. I don't think that they do. I think there's a very strong tradition of romanticizing history, and 90% of historical novels are actually not that much based in fact as in fiction. Uh, and to surrender that privilege, to subscribe just to facts, would be not a good thing from a writing point of view. So you are saying that fiction would be the superior genre? No, I'm saying fiction opposite. is fiction, and even history if it is, is historical history. fiction, because even history is not entirely a reli reliable well, science. Exactly what I was saying. Uh, so I think whose history, who's writing it, Quite who's right. saying it, you have to judge the context. Mm, yeah. So it would be a very dangerous idea to think that you can promote any kind of history through fiction. I think that that is a uh, very sorry. good point. Sorry. <laughs> no, but, but may I just... Uh, uh, I, I mean, without disputing what you're saying, I just think historic, it's very broad thing of saying historical fiction. Traditional uh, explanation of what is historical fiction is that you create fictional characters uh, against a historical landscape. I mean, you have war and peace. Mm. So everybody is fictional, but there's war happening and there is this, etc. It's a certain historical. But I mean, books, there is now this, this area, for instance, this book and uh, I, you know, I tormented myself a long time when I was writing this, that is this. When you're actually taking a real character and adding in elements of personality fiction. So this is different in many ways. So nowadays publishers and editors call this faction. Mm. So you're taking facts and, you know, making it into fiction. So it is different from, a, say, a book like War and Peace, not only because that was written by Tolstoy and this is written by me, but, <laughs> but you know, it's different because there you've got, come, you know, you, I, I believe Georgette Hare or somebody, you know, you have fictional characters against a particular large events of history. But here you actually have a historical character, so here what you do with him becomes, again, the author's responsibility to make sure that what you do with him doesn't distort history. If, if, and, and you're absolutely right. The, it, there could be cases when history gets distorted, by, as much by historians for example, as by fiction. Writers. For example, what you're calling exile, I would call abduction. So I mean, that's just so the Leap Singh the was abducted by the British. That is the fact. No, he he was made to say, "I want to go to England." Exactly. So it was. A, so it was this a, is a perspective, isn't it? Even this is a perspective. But as you say, that's true. So well, exile or abduction or, yeah. is, you know, yeah. while abduction is a, uh, is a legal act or illegal act, I think exile is more a psychological feeling. I'm going to quote Hilary Mantle to wind this up because uh, it actually alludes quite nicely to this present discussion. Well-written historical fiction doesn't betray history, but opens it up to inspection. And if you do want to know more, that's your business. Check with the bibliography and go off. Mm. But I would highly recommend that you start with these two uh, novels <laughs> that are upstairs. They've been stocked in the bookshop. And I think the authors are there for ready to be to sign your copy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.